Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Cirrus Logic third quarter fiscal year 2024 financial results Q&A session. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After a brief statement, we will open up the call for questions from analysts. Instructions for queuing up will be provided at that time. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded for replay purposes. I would now like to turn the conference call over to Ms. Chelsea Heffernan, Vice President of Investor Relations. Ms. Heffernan, you may begin. Thank you and good afternoon. Joining me on today's call is John Forsyth, Cirrus Logic's President and Chief Executive Officer, and Vank Nathamuni, Chief Financial Officer. Today at approximately 4 p.m. Eastern Time, we announced our financial results for the third quarter, fiscal year 2024. The shareholder letter discussing our financial results, the company's earnings release, and the webcast of this Q&A session are all available at the company's investor relations website. This call will feature questions from the analysts covering our company. Additionally, the results and guidance we discuss on this call will include non-GAAP financial measures that exclude certain items. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP measures to their most directly comparable GAAP measures are included in our earnings release and are all available on the company's investor relations website. Please note that during the session, we may make projections and other forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from projections. By providing this information, the company expressly disclaims any obligation to update or revise any projections or forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new developments or otherwise. Please refer to the press release and the shareholder letter issued today which are available on the Cirrus Logic website and the latest Form 10-K, as well as other corporate filings registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission for additional discussion of risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from current expectations. I will now turn the call over to John. Thank you, Chelsea, and thank you everyone for joining our call today. As you've seen in the press release that Chelsea referred to, in the third quarter of fiscal year 2024, Cirrus Logic delivered record revenue of $619 million and record non-GAAP earnings per share of $2.89. In a moment, I'm going to hand the call over to Venk to discuss these results in greater detail. But before we get on to that, I'd like to provide a quick update on the progress we've made in the last quarter regarding the long-term growth strategy that I've outlined on prior calls. As I've said previously, our first strategic pr priority is leadership in smartphone audio, where we are looking forward to introducing our next generation custom boosted amplifier and our first 2020, 22 nanometer smart codec later this year. These new products will deliver significant performance improvements over prior generations, enabling our customers to build more compelling and power efficient devices for users. In addition to preparing these products for launch, we're also continuing to win designs with Android customers on next generation flagship smartphones. During the quarter, a key Android customer began shipping its latest flagship phones featuring, featuring Cirrus Logic audio amplifiers. And we also began ramping multiple components for the early 2024 launch of another leading Android flagship device. Shifting to the second pillar of our strategy, we remain very enthusiastic about the potential to grow content in smartphones with our high-performance mixed signal solutions. We view this product line as a substantial opportunity to not only expand our addressable market, but also to grow and diversify our revenue. Our progress in this area has been showcased with our camera controllers. Since the introduction of our first camera controller in calendar year 2020, we have launched three generations of these products with each delivering enhanced performance, functionality, and most recently, in the fall of 2023, additional signal processing capability to enable new features. The overall value of our camera content has increased over time, and we foresee this upward trend continuing in the future as we maintain our close engineering collaboration with our customer to further innovate in this area. Beyond the camera, we also see significant potential to expand our addressable market with advanced power and battery-related technologies. And today, we are actively engaged in a number of R&D programs focused on power and battery performance, which we believe can fuel future growth. The third element of our strategy is our focus on expanding into new applications and markets beyond smartphones. 
In this area, we continue to be excited about the opportunities we see in the laptop business. Today, we are delivering content to each of the top five laptop OEMs and actively pursuing many future design opportunities. In January, at CES 2024, we saw a leading laptop OEM introduce two flagship laptops featuring several of our amplifiers, multiple haptic drivers, and a codec. Moreover, in addition to our growing momentum in laptop audio, in the December quarter, we were pleased to have been awarded our first laptop power socket, further exp expanding our laptop content opportunity. And yesterday, we were proud to announce our collaboration with Intel and Microsoft on a new PC reference design for Intel's upcoming Lunar Lake processor. This reference design includes our codec, amplifier, and power converter products, and will enable the creation of richer, more immersive audio experiences for laptops, as well as extending battery life and enabling thinner, sleeker laptop designs. Finally, we remain keen to deploy our products and technologies in further markets beyond smartphones and laptops. And in the December quarter, we began ramping production of two custom components for a newly introduced augmented reality computing device. With our commitment to product innovation and world-class execution, we believe we can continue to identify and capitalize on further opportunities in new applications and markets in ways that grow our business. With this growing and diversifying portfolio of technologies and products, it's important that we actively invest in our supply chain in order both to develop new process technology that will meet the needs of future generations of products and in order to provide our customers with the assurance of supply and geographical diversity that is becoming increasingly important. During the December quarter, we took delivery of and commenced validation of our first silicon from a new foundry partner. This development will serve to qualify both the process technology and core IP needed to enable the creation of next generation power solutions and provides us with a path to delivering those products from fabrication facilities based in the United States. We believe that this initiative will help make our supply chain more resilient and competitive and help us meet our customers' needs for innovation and quality for many years to come. In summary, we're pleased with our progress in the December quarter as we delivered record financial results and executed on many important areas of product development. With a commitment to great execution and to serving our customers in their mission to deliver the world's most innovative products, we are today investing in the product areas that we believe will enable the company to grow and diversify in the coming years. And with that, let me now turn the call over to Venk to provide an overview of our financial results for our fiscal Q3 2024, as well as guidance for the fourth quarter. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start with our fiscal third quarter results and then provide guidance for fiscal Q4. Thanks to outstanding execution from the entire Cirrus team, we delivered record revenue as well as record earnings per share for the fiscal third quarter. Revenue was $619 million, which was significantly above our guidance range as sales of components, shipping, and smartphones exceeded our expectations, driven by strength in orders from our largest customer. Shipments stayed strong throughout the quarter, including the post-holiday week, and we also benefited from an additional week of revenue in the quarter associated with the 53-week fiscal year. As such, revenue was up 29% quarter over quarter, and increased 5% year over year due to higher smartphone unit volumes. Turning now to gross profit and margins, non-GAAP gross profit in the quarter was $317.9 million, and non-GAAP gross margin was strong at 51.4%, driven by the higher revenue. On a sequential basis, gross margin was roughly flat while on a year-over-year -year basis, gross margin increased by 110 basis points, reflecting lower supply chain costs, mainly driven by the absence of wafer premiums and expedite fees, as well as favorable inventory reserves. This was partially offset by a less favorable product mix. Non-GAAP operating expenses in the quarter were $125.6 million, up $11.2 million sequentially, Non-GAAP operating expenses increased by 10% sequentially, 
but were substantially below the 29% quarter-over-quarter increase in revenue. The sequential increase was mostly due to higher employee-related costs, including an extra week of salaries and benefits associated with the 53-week year, as well as variable compensation. As in prior quarters, we will continue to control discretionary expenses. Non-GAAP operating income was $192.2 million in the third quarter, or 31.1% of revenue. Turning now to taxes, our GAAP and non-GAAP tax rates for the December quarter were lower than expected due to recent IRS guidance issued to U.S. taxpayers regarding R&D expense amortization rules in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Consequently, our tax rates for the December quarter reflect the cumulative tax benefit of applying the IRS guidance to decrease R&D capitalization amounts for all periods since the fiscal year 23 effective date of this provision. And lastly, on the P&L, non-GAAP net income in the third quarter was $160.6 million, or a record $2.89 per share, as the higher than expected revenue and gross margin flowed through to the bottom line in addition to the one-time tax benefit I alluded to earlier. Let me now turn to the balance sheet. Our balance sheet continues to remain strong, and we ended the third quarter of fiscal 24 with approximately $587 million in cash and cash equivalents. Our ending cash balance was up $234.5 million from the prior quarter, primarily due to strong cash flow from operations, partially offset by stock repurchases during the quarter. We continue to have no debt outstanding. Additionally, as noted in prior quarters, we have $300 million undrawn on our revolver credit facility. I'd like to reiterate that our balance sheet remains strong with a solid cash position and no debt. During the December quarter, we reduced inventory levels. Inventory balance at the end of the third quarter was $256.7 million, down from $328.9 million in Q2 as we drew down inventory to support our largest customer's new product launch. As a result, days of inventory declined 50 days sequentially, and we ended the quarter with approximately 78 days of inventory, down from 128 days in the prior quarter. Looking ahead, in Q4 fiscal 24, we expect inventory dollars to increase slightly from the prior quarter. We continue to actively manage our inventory position to meet customer demand while still fulfilling our purchase commitments. And turning to cash flow, cash flow from operations was $313.7 million in the December quarter, and CapEx was roughly $9.8 million, resulting in non-GAAP free cash flow margin for the quarter of 49%. For the 12-month period ending in the December quarter, non-GAAP free cash flow margin was 14%. On the share buyback front in Q3, we utilized roughly $57 million to repurchase approximately 780,000 shares of our common stock at an average price of $72.93. As of the end of Q3 fiscal 24, we had $365 million remaining in our share repurchase authorization. We expect to continue to return capital in the form of stock repurchases, which we believe will provide a long-term benefit to shareholders going forward. And now on to the guidance. For Q4 of fiscal 24, we expect revenue in the range of $290 million to $350 million. We expect gross margin to range from 49% to 51%. Non-GAAP operating expenses are expected to decrease sequentially and to be in the range of $114 million to $120 million, primarily due to lower variable compensation and one less week of salaries as we return to a 13-week quarter. Overall, from an operating expense perspective, we will continue to control discretionary spending, but invest strategically in product development to drive long-term growth. Our fiscal 2024 non-GAAP tax rate is expected to be approximately 21% to 23%,
which is lower than our prior quarter's guidance of 24% to 26%, and reflects the cumulative tax benefit of applying recent IRS guidance that clarified aspects of the capitalized R&D rules. In closing, we had a strong Q3 fiscal 24 as we delivered record revenue and record non-GAAP earnings per share, thanks to the collective efforts and strong execution by the entire Cirrus Logic team. Going forward, we will continue to focus on the best opportunities to enable the company to grow both revenue and profitability over the long term. And finally, while we understand there is intense interest related to our largest customer, in accordance with Citus Logic company policy, we will not discuss any specifics about this business relationship. With that, let me now t- turn the call to Chelsea to start the Q&A session. Thanks, Bank. We will now start the Q&A portion of the earnings call. Please limit yourself to a single question and one follow-up. Operator, we are now ready to take questions. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, simply press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Your first question will come from the line of Tor Sandberg with Steeple. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, congratulations on the record revenue and uh, especially the, the cash flows. Um, first question, um, so John, you said in your uh, shareholder letter that the camera content has increased over time. You know, you just introduced your third generation. Um, but, you know, it's going to be like three generations in three years. So should we assume there's going to be a fourth generation next year that will, um, you know, potentially have some additional content? Uh, and obviously that's above and beyond what's happening on the audio side. Thank you, Tari, and, and thanks for the nice words. I, I wouldn't assume that um, as, a, as a baseline assumption. What we have seen over time is that the value of the uh, content has, has grown partly with the introduction of new camera controllers from us, which have more features, but partly also as a consequence of increased attach rate and then uh, greater proliferation through the SKUs and generations of products. So we see that as being a as as being the kind of collection of drivers to the trend of, of growth and value over time. That's not to say that we don't have plenty of uh, development uh, work going on in the pipeline around the uh, the camera controller. We do uh, have some very exciting stuff, but uh, we're not signaling uh, a time frame for that uh, coming to market yet. Good, thank you. And, and as my follow-up, uh, you announced the new the new foundry. It, it sounds like maybe that's more for for power management. Correct me if I'm wrong there, but uh, should we sort of assume that uh, this goes hand in hand with some of the R and D programs you have have going on the way? And you know, how long would it take, I guess, for um, you know you and your foundry partner to develop this to be a very high volume uh, business? Uh, right. Yeah. Great. Great question. The focus there is predominantly around power-related devices, so that that might include some power management, power conversion. Uh, obviously, we've we've uh, had some products out there that we call power conversion control and so on, which don't quite fit any of the neat uh, boxes in that uh, in that area of products. But that kind of stuff generally will be extremely well served as we go forward by uh, by this uh, foundry uh, partnership. And so, yes, that's uh, a yes to the first part of your question. In terms of time frame, well, we've just seen the first silicon. I think we're we're very excited by it, but that's still quite some way from that being a, a high volume uh, kind of process for us. So, you know, think think of us as being still, you know, two three years out from actually having product, and then you know, probably probably not starting with uh, uh, with a huge volume product just so that we can get up the ramp safely together. But uh, these things are. Um, they they take a while to develop, but then, as I think our track record has shown, certainly in other areas where we've invested in, and worked very very closely with foundry partners, um, we then get uh, you know many many years. Uh, and in fact, um, in in the case of some of our products, that's uh, a decade or so of deriving a lot of. Uh, competitive advantage and uh, performance advantage from the the work that we've done together on process development. So it takes a while, but then we're very excited about where it can take us in the long run. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Ramsey with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, John, I wanted to ask about the the notebook market. It's been 
something that's been on the come for for Cirrus for a while. And you mentioned, um, and congrats on on the uh, partnership with Intel and Microsoft. You mentioned being in uh, shipping to the uh, each of the top five laptop OEMs. And I, I wanted it's a it's a fraction of the units of the smartphone market, but it, it's not that horribly different from the units shipped into the smartphone market by your largest customer. So I'm just trying to uh, get my head around how you're thinking about the notebook opportunity over time in terms of um, realistically addressable market in the next three to five years. Is this something that you could ship many of the same components into and um, from a unit perspective and an ASP perspective collectively, it's it's relatively similar opportunity to what your, your company is serving in the smartphone space given you ship primarily to, to one big customer there. I'm just trying to get calibrate my expectations over a three to five year period of how you're thinking about that market. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So just to unpack uh, that a little, um, we, we are in the early innings, um, and I've I've given a bit of color previously on what I expected our uh, our potential revenue ramp. Um, maybe over the next year or two. So, you know, fiscal 24, we're really just, it's de minimis, but as we uh, uh, get into fiscal 25, we, we think um, that'll be kind of low tens of millions and then growing beyond that. So the work that you're seeing us talk about today when we talk about design ends and, and the uh, Lunar Lake uh, reference platform, that's really mostly feeding into products that we'll see in calendar 25. So that that's, uh, should be uh, um, uh, an accelerant to, uh, to revenue there. I would like to put a ceiling on the, on the SAM that we see because that's uh, as we uncover more opportunities, um, I think that uh, we, we are feeling more optimistic about that over time. There are certain variables there which uh, honestly are, uh, remain to be seen, like for example, how many uh, amplifiers are attached in uh, in the various different product tiers. So we see today designs ranging from between two boosted amplifiers to six boosted amplifiers. And that may be alongside a codec. Um, and uh, in the case of the flagship products that we talked about in the opening remarks and that were launched in January, we also saw haptics drivers uh, along there as well. So I think you know that that's the color on the revenue ramp that we see right now. I think that the biggest and most important thing here is really the the, the three milestones that we've uh, we've passed. So, uh, first of all, seeing the launch of the the audio products. Uh, so those um, those boosted amplifiers and the codec that were in that product that uh, in those products that I mentioned, those are laptop specific, brand new audio products from us. Um, then and and the audio proposition I think is extremely strong. So you know what we've seen in in benchmarking that against the competition is that uh, our products enable you to double the output loudness, three um, x the the uh, low frequency response, while consuming fifty percent less board space, fifty percent less power, and something like a third of the overall component count. Um, so that's a very compelling uh, proposition. It's going to take time to to see people uh, adopt you know, all of that or parts of it, and for that to proliferate down through the tiers. But I think the the opportunity is is very very significant. And then, so the first milestone was really getting those audio products into the market and and launched. The second is winning our first power products. So again, that's something where we can see uh an, an attach rate where where that gets designed in the attach rate. Uh, can be two or three uh, products. In some cases, conceivably more than that. But um, that again, uh, and and those products, the power conversion products, are um, you know fairly significant uh, uh, value by our standards. So kind of buck and change. Um, so we we don't know where the uh, exactly like how far down through the tiers that can go yet. But again, it's it's it represents a great opportunity, um, and getting the first the first design in of power products is a very significant milestone for us. And then third, the third milestone that we're talking about here today really is that reference design launch. And that, um, as we know, can be a real catalyst for, uh, for helping design activity as we go forward. Yeah, and, and Matt, this is Venk. Uh, just to add to what uh, John said, in terms of just the, the total size of the opportunity that we're looking at, as well as the pricing uh, question that you asked, 
So uh, clearly, we're starting out with addressing the high end of the laptop space. And as John just alluded to, there's a range of possibilities there in terms of selling the codec and the amplifiers and then power eventually. Uh, and then just from a pricing standpoint, I'd say, uh, you know, we expect this to be in line or above our corporate average uh, gross margins. So that's our model long term. And that's what we're working towards achieving. Yeah, thank, thank you both for all the detail there. Don't don't worry, we won't get over our skis of modeling. I'm just trying to sort of calibrate my my expectations over the, the longer term. Um, as my follow up question, it, it's a a year where, as you sort of, I guess, reemphasize that you're going to be shipping a new um, codec on 22 nanometer and new boosted amplifiers um, both um, later this year. And and I guess I just wanted to ask. Uh, is there going to be anything different? I mean, units aside, which obviously you, you won't want to predict, but um, anything different in the revenue ramp cadence or, or timing, given you have new products shipping in on both the, the Kodak and the amplifier side, just um, all else equal on units, would you expect a different shape to the year because both of those products would be new into SKUs? Thanks. Yeah, Matt, I'll address that. Um, no, I think you, you correctly identified the increased content that we had alluded to in prior quarters in terms of what we expect in our fiscal 25. Um, and uh, I think uh, in terms of just the timing of those ramps, the, the typical pattern with our customers being to, to ramp those products in a, right around the mid, middle of the year, plus or minus. So I, we, don't, we don't see anything that's fundamentally changed in terms of the, the timing of those ramps. And in terms of the, the overall content, you know, we did talk about those uh, four components uh, that will have a, a newer generation uh, compared to the prior uh, compared to the prior uh, phone model. So uh, we're pretty excited about the fact that we're reducing the, the next generation of the codec and uh, three instantiations of the next generation of the amplifier, and that's what we expect will drive our uh, performance in fiscal 25. Your next question comes from the line of Thomas O'Malley with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, good evening, guys, and thanks for taking the question. Uh, John, in the script, you talked about two custom components for an augmented reality uh, product. Um, could you talk about what sort of products you would be shipping into to, to that genre, um, and then potentially, you know, how you see that portfolio scaling? You're, you're seeing, you know, small unit volumes to start there over the past couple of years, but that could obviously be a lot larger in the coming years. Um, just want to understand where you guys best address that market. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I think we're, we're excited about that category without really having anything significant in our model uh, for it for now, as you, uh, as you alluded to. If you look back over the, the last uh, three or four years, I think perhaps even slightly longer than that since the category has been emerging of VR and, and AR, We've got a very good track record of getting uh, sockets in there, uh, typically with off-the-shelf silicon and typically focused on audio. In this case, the components that I was alluding to in my opening remarks are actually in the HPMS category. I'm not going to be more specific about what they're doing than that, but again, that's a that's a positive for us, I would, I would take, um, as it demonstrates that we have both uh, HPMS and audio relevant capabilities for that category of device. And I think that that makes a lot of sense because we know that physical size, physical weight and power efficiency are going to be incredibly important when it comes to anything that you uh, you have to wear on your head for extended periods. Uh, so we're excited long term and and we'll we'll kind of continue to monitor that category as uh, hopefully it uh, it accelerates. Super helpful. And then switching to an entirely different topic, just back on the the other updates in the new foundry. Uh, I just wanted to be clear. So you're talking geographical diversity. You're talking more power products there. Is, is this a foundry that's based in the U.S. or just a foundry that has a facility in the U.S.? Just trying to understand better the, the you know, the landscape. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the foundry facilities are, are in the U.S. Uh, I, I think uh, I think I'll, I'll probably leave it there. We're, we're still in fairly, fairly early uh uh, early innings with them in, in the partnership, um, but uh, uh, yeah, as, as you correctly highlighted, we have seen geographical diversity become an increasingly important concern, along with the other things that we look uh, look for, 
uh, within our uh, uh, supply chain and foundry partnerships, namely uh, technology leadership, uh, assurance of supply, and a competitive playing field. Your next question comes from the line of Christopher Rowland with Susquehanna. Please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks for the question. Um, mine's around the Intel reference designs. Uh, so first of all, I just want to make sure you you are not in the Meteor Lake reference design. Uh, I would assume that you're not in the Arrow Lake, and so the first one would be Lunar Lake. Um, I guess getting into a reference design, how does that change the profile of wins for this market? And uh, and, and and I guess tied to this as well, this power product, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about this? Is it power conversion? Is it uh, DC, DC? What, what, um, what's its actual function? Thank you. I, yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I, I would love to be able to tell you with confidence what it's going to do for the design momentum. I think, uh, but we, the truth is we don't know yet. Uh, I think it can only be a good thing. I think we're certainly, we've been very excited uh, in that uh, collaboration with Intel and Microsoft about the vision for laptop devices, which are substantially more immersive when it comes to the audio and visual experience and uh, thinner, lighter, more power efficient. So we're very, very proud to be a part of that. How that translates in terms of adoption and what it means for designing of our components, it's probably too early for us to say. I would say that um, typically I think uh, you can expect pretty good design momentum on the back of being on the reference design as, as you would expect. And also, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're excited that um, it looks like that that laptop mo uh, market may uh, see a bit of a, uh, a kick from uh, from the interest in AI-centric uh, devices and use cases as well. So, you know, hopefully we're we're getting aboard a train that's uh, that's accelerating there. Uh, the 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 power conversion product itself, um, yeah, that's leveraging uh, switch cap uh, power conversion uh, technology, which originated with the the Lion acquisition uh, that we did. So it's it's replacing a kind of uh, uh, a, a classic. Um, a multi-phase buck controller uh, a power converter, a power conversion architecture. So it reduces the component count as well as really significantly increases the efficiency of the DC to DC conversion. Um, so your heat losses are, are much lower. Uh, you're uh, you're able to uh, uh, to effectively get get more done using less power from, uh, drawn from the battery. Um, so. That's really going to be focused primarily on driving, you know, fanless and single fan designs, so thinner, quieter, uh, more efficient products. Uh, that's great. Nice to see that line acquisition come around. Um, uh, my second question uh, is around gross margin, uh, and in particular, um, uh, as we think about laptop products mixing in, but also this new content coming, um, you know, in the fall. Uh, is there anything that we should consider regarding gross margin between here and there? Yeah, Chris, thanks for the question, Zvang. So, um, you know, from, from a gross margin perspective, as I alluded to earlier, as it relates to the, the PC business, we do expect that to be in line or slightly accretive to our gross margins long term. As you know, our model has been fairly steady between 49 and 51 percent. And in you know, some quarters, we come in close to the high end, some quarters right in the middle. And I think that's driven by the fact that we want to optimize between revenue growth and profitability such that, you know, we still are able to grow the top line uh, at a fairly decent clip. And, and maintain good profitability. Now, over time, our, our ob objective obviously is to improve the profitability across the board, and that's driven by you know uh, the fact that we, we want to improve the, the supply chain uh, infrastructure and you know just boost efficiencies in general. But I think for the next uh, at least a year or so, you can model it between the 49 to 51 percent range, and that's inclusive of the PC business. As I said, with the PC business, we expect to be in line or above the corporate average. Your next question comes from the line of Ananda Barua with Loop Capital. Please go ahead. 
Hey, yeah, thanks, guys, for taking the question. Good afternoon, and uh, congrats on the on the really solid execution. Um, I guess two quick ones, if I could. Hey. Maybe, hey, John, just dovetailing off of uh, your your remark about Gen AI uh, a moment ago. It does seem like there's an increasing commitment from you know sort of edge device makers, the phone makers, the PC makers, to lean in to uh, to Gen AI you know, sort of configs. And so I guess the question is, if that were to happen at some critical mass, the benefit to you, would it be a volume feature? Uh, is there a mixed component? You know, I guess any context you can share there on on how it would benefit you guys. Uh, and then I have a quick follow-up as well. Uh, yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Ananda. Um, I, I think, I mean, there's certainly a, growing tendency for people to to jump on the, the AI edge AI bandwagon from a marketing perspective. I I, I'm, uh, I think there's probably some substance uh, there and and uh, um, and uh, the, that uh, in some cases there may be less. Um, in our case, when we think about AI uh, at the edge, I, I really think it, it comes down to the, the potential that really comes down to three things. Um, one is like to the extent that it, it excites and inspires users, and I think end users uh, do want a number of the features. You can see that with, with the adoption of, of AI services. Um, then you know that's exciting from a unit's point of view, and clearly when I talk about the laptop uh, market, seeing that kind of coming over the, the horizon as a as a catalyst for uh, uh, for unit sales, that's very exciting. Secondly, I think just that uh, AI and Gen AI uh, has the potential to uh, open up uh, a lot more uh, a variety of, of ways in in which you interact with the device. So to the extent that people are interacting with the device more via audio and speech interfaces, uh, which are obviously enabled by AI, I think that's very good for us. And we can see things that we could potentially do uh, there in the audio domain uh, that could be very beneficial. And then finally, I think on the power front, that's the third uh, area where I think we uh, we stand to benefit because uh, AI is, is clearly very power hungry. Uh, the result is everybody, you know, everybody wants to do more with less. And that's squarely what our power conversion products are aimed at and our overall approach to power efficiency and everything that we do. That's great context. I, I appreciate it. That's super helpful. And I guess the quick follow up is just really a clarification. Um, when you were speaking earlier about PC SAM, um, you said something around uh, like sort of putting a ceiling on the SAM. Did you did you say you would or wouldn't put a ceiling on that SAM as you guys think about it? I, I think it's premature to put a ceiling on it right now. Um, as I as I indicated, there are we've we've got a very good array of products, so we've got these kind of new to serious laptop specific products across uh, audio and power. We've got an amazing portfolio of haptics products. And one of the things that we don't yet have a feeling for, and I think this is because the market is going to discover it, is what the what the right attach rates for those various products are. So in some cases it'll be it'll be two boosted amplifiers, in some cases um, maybe none, but driven by a codec, and in some cases it might be six boosted amplifiers. Similarly, you know we saw multiple haptics drivers to drive very large trackpad areas and so on. So I think I think we're we're still in the discovery phase there and and uh, you know the opportunities are very exciting. This will be our final question from the line of Tori Sin Vanberg with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Yeah thanks. I just had a, a few housekeeping ones uh, for you Venk. Uh Venk so this is your strongest cash balance ever. Uh rates are high so um, how should we think about the other income line going forward? And, and now that you have all this cash, should we assume continuous buybacks, or you know, are you also uh, looking at some potential M&A? Yeah, Tori, totally. thanks for those questions. And uh, yeah, and as you pointed out, our cash balance is, is really strong at 587 million. Um, I think the way to think about the interest that we generated, obviously we've benefited, especially in the last three or four quarters with the higher interest rates. And uh, the way we've structured our, our portfolio, we, we do expect that to continue for some time to come. And uh, you know, clearly, from a from an M&A perspective, it certainly gives us the optionality. 
just for everybody's benefit, I do want to highlight the fact that, you know, in terms of our strategy, the first use of cash is obviously to continue to grow the business. You know, we have lots of irons in the fire in terms of the projects that we're working on, the technologies that we're working on and such, and we want to continue to uh, invest in R&D going forward uh, as we have in the past. And then obviously, uh, you know, we've been doing buybacks and uh, we'll be, you know, regular buyers. You know, the quantum of those buybacks will depend on market conditions and such. And then M&A is, is also a, an option. And, you know, in this environment, we do feel that the M&A uh, environment is getting somewhat better than, than it was the last couple of years. Uh, obviously, too early to call what happens with regulation and such, but we, we feel uh, there's enough uh, in the pipeline for us to be able to uh, consider M&A. And, uh, and at the right time, we will we'll share that with you in more detail. With that, we will end the Q&A session. I will now turn the call back to John for his final remarks. Thank you, Operator. In summary, Cirrus Logic delivered record revenue and earnings per share for the third quarter and continued to execute on important initiatives across each of the three key areas of our strategy. We're excited about the opportunities in front of us, and we thank you for your continued interest in our progress. In addition, I'd also like to extend my appreciation to the entire Cirrus Logic team and to our supply chain partners and customers around the world. It's thanks to their commitment, support, and partnership that we've been able to deliver these results. Before we close, I'd also like to note that we will be participating in the Susquehanna Virtual Technology Conference on February 29th, the Morgan Stanley Technology Media and Telecom Conference on March the 7th in San Francisco, and the Loop Capital Conference in New York City on March the 12th. Please check our investor website for all the details. Thank you, everyone, for joining our call today. That does conclude today's call. Thank you all for joining. You may now disconnect.